Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today on the Roundup, we're going to be taking a look at three important questions we've been hearing from international educators this past week. Uh, we'll get to those questions in just a bit, but first we want to say a special hello to everybody who's watching live on Facebook. Always great to have your input live on the day and uh, get your feedback on some of these important issues. Uh, also, a special shout out to those watching on repeat, either on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. And you have a special place in my heart if you download this podcast for the Midweek Roundup. So I encourage you all to check that out. We've over, had over a thousand downloads of the podcast over the last uh, year. So we're really excited about where the, what the future holds for the Midweek Roundup and where we're going from here. Uh, in terms of where we'll start uh, today, uh, as we do each week, we look at the stories that have popped in the news over the last seven or eight days, and we compile those in our weekly newsletter called All the SMIE News Fit to Share, and SMIE stands for Social Media and International Ed, and that's the name of my business, Social Media and International Ed Consulting, and what we do is you send that out on Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern, and you get that in your inbox, it has four or five uh, social media stories, also uh, probably 20 to 30 uh, international ed stories and oftentimes where those two topics overlap and that becomes the nexus of what we talk about here on Wednesdays. So let's get right into the first question. Uh, there's been a lot of news stories over the last few weeks about international applications and applications in general being up this year. Uh, but the question is, are international applications up across the board? Uh, this year and as a result of Common App and uh, Test Optional and all the other trends we talk about here regularly on the Roundup or, or is it just more concentration at the upper end of the selectivity scale and we'll talk about what those issues and there's a, uh, about these issues and there are two articles in particular that I'll be sharing one from Forbes that asked the question uh, international student applications to the US uh, colleges are rebounding is it a Biden bounce? And that's certainly something that uh, I think is a little premature to say a Biden bounce, though I'm certainly encouraged by <clears throat> the steps this administration has taken in the first few days. But you must keep, keep in mind that these students were thinking of applying before uh, to the United States before uh, Biden was, uh, was elected. And so there's certainly, uh, there's gonna be a bump uh, for obviously applications that come in after uh, after the inauguration and after the, obviously the election results, and we're seeing some of that now. But uh, the positive messaging coming out, uh, am, I, am I gonna be the first to call it a Biden bounce? No, I'm calling it a test optional bounce. And that's probably where I would say uh, more of the, um, more of the, of the benefit I think in seeing applications surging uh, is, uh, is, is largely due to that. And why is that? Uh, why do I put as much faith in the test optional piece? Not just uh, the Biden uh, influence on his election and just being a very different uh, uh, approach to uh, managing a country uh, than we've had for the last four years. Uh, certainly uh, when the pandemic struck, uh, one of the first things that uh, fell by the wayside were availability of tests. Test centers weren't operating. Uh, there were uh, basically any public gatherings over a certain number of people were prohibited. Uh, there were lockdowns, all sorts of reasons why testing just wasn't happening in test centers as, as per normal. So uh, what had, what's happened uh, in, over, the, over the summer and certainly going into the spring now, uh, we're seeing colleges that made the decision to be test optional as a pilot year for 2021. Uh, making the decision to extend that for one or two years uh, because uh, a continued unavailability of tests and uh, to make it an equitable, uh, equitable use in, in college admissions, if it were to be that, uh, certainly would have to be available in a m much more widely than it currently is. So uh, it's no surprise, frankly, that uh, we're seeing uh, more colleges now jumping on the test optional bandwagon for year two and even year three. Uh, some have, like the University of California system, have uh, uh, gone completely test neutral uh, or test, uh, not even test optional. Uh, they are, uh, they will no longer require any sort of test, test blind, uh, and uh, unless a, a new test comes into play after five years. So I think uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that test optional has been a real driving force 
because when you think about it, uh, for so many, uh, so many students that might not be the best test takers, that might be from socially disadvantaged and economically disadvantaged groups in the United States or out, outside the United States who have previously only been able to take the SAT once, maybe twice if they're lucky, and there's costs involved with that. There's uh, test biases that are involved in these things, uh, discussions. When uh, students that uh, previously uh, were, when they took the SAT or ACT, uh, were, were getting scores that were well below the, the averages for students applying to top tier schools. Um, this, uh, when, when these schools now became test optional for this academic year, uh, for the next academic year entering in 2021, that gave, uh, that kind of gave a green light to any student who's really strong in the classroom, probably has excellent grades and is involved in a lot of different things, but just doesn't have the test scores to, uh, to be competitive. So those students in that category who said, well, my test scores would have normally precluded me from even thinking about applying to these selective schools are now, those doors are wide open to me. And certainly the, um, the data that's uh, shown in the Forbes article and again in the Inside Higher Ed article titled The Full Story on Admissions in terms of the particularly common app data uh, that has shown uh, what, what some of the more selective schools, that their, their applications have increased by 42% at Harvard, by F University of Virginia by 15%. Uh, huge jumps in uh, California and the UC system to Berkeley and, and at UCLA. Uh, and they focus in that article on the inside higher ed a lot on the uh, minority groups in the United States and the extent of uh, the increase in students applying uh, to the UC system. So. Uh, this is really uh, encouraging to see this, and I think this is a, a start of a trend uh, that uh, that test optional will become extended through two for two more years, and certainly at many at many of the top schools that will see the value of that. And the reality is that uh, they can't use a test in admissions if the majority, greater majority of their student applicants don't have the ability to even take it. Uh, so whenever that pendulum swings back and test centers are again available, maybe they'll reconsider. Uh, but because that's a that's a security blanket uh, for a lot of uh, schools, and, and one of the as I mentioned, one of the reasons they're seeing these large increases in applications at the most selective schools is it's a it's it's a a one shot chance for some of these kids that uh, have uh, the academics but not the test scores typically to to potentially get in uh, and be in the mix. Whether they'll get in is obviously going to be a very different story, but I'll be very interested to see the, uh, certainly the uh, admissions teams at these most selective schools are working overtime in reading season, um, probably hiring on extra, extra readers to, to get the job done because, my goodness, a 42% increase at Harvard who's already over, over swamped. Not that I'm feeling sorry for them, I never will, uh, but you, you have to think about uh, think about the, the staff that are doing the reading. That's, that's a whole lot of extra stuff that they're dealing with. Uh, and they're creating new models for how they're going to define the criteria for admitting students in their class that don't include test scores. That might have been an automatic cut for a lot of students in the past. Um, but there's going to be a lot, uh, a lot, hopefully a lot different makeup to the incoming class at some of these top schools in the next year. And if those students come in, do well, academically and uh, maybe the institution will reconsider going back to requiring SAT, ACT when those uh, are again available. So interesting, uh, interesting look at test optional, which I think is a bigger driver. On the international side, certainly uh, the Biden impact is going to be a part of that. Uh, I think it's a, anybody but Trump would have been a different, would have been a, uh, an uplifting experience for international students to see what was coming. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't uh, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, as was talked about uh, during Open Doors uh, by Alan Goodman, President and CEO of IIE, there is a lot of pent-up demand uh, that are where students are hoping that come next fall uh, the restrictions will be relieved, uh, there will be increased uh, availability of visas, uh, that uh, campuses will be more in person. Uh, I think even the even the Cal State system that committed to being online only for the entire 2020-2021 academic year have made it a stated goal to be back in person in the fall. So hopefully that that happens. I hope all campuses can uh, return to a somewhat new normal. 
of uh, in-person instruction because that's certainly what drives so many international students here is that experience on campus, in the classroom, outside of class, on campus, involved in activities. And that's going to be something that will look different probably uh, still even in the fall. But it's going to be something that I think we're, we're seeing uh, some, uh, some positive signs, early signs that uh, that pent-up demand is re revealing itself in applications. Certainly the Common App is the undergraduate uh, application uh, source, and not, uh, not every university. Uh, about 900 schools are a part of that right now. But uh, there, are, uh, there are, from in terms of where the applicants are coming from, from overseas uh, that are using Common App, uh, they were up almost across the board with the notable exception of China, which was down 18 percent. And a lot of that is probably residual uh, Trumpism uh, and the effect uh, he had on uh, interest in China and maybe uncertainty as to what policy will be uh, toward China in the coming year. But positive signs, India up 28 percent. For undergraduate students from India to be up that much is, is, a, is a really remarkable sign. Uh, Canada up 22%, Nigeria up 12%, Pakistan up 37%, UK up 23%, Brazil up 41% using the Common App this year. That's encouraging. And I think that uh, is something we'll, want, we'll certainly want to keep an eye on, that the applications are up. Certainly uh, because of these schools, selective schools that are part of Common App, not every one of those is selective, but uh, certainly the majority are, and that when they're seeing these kind of... Um, jumps uh, in international students, that test optional switch has uh, really opened the floodgates. And if, it, if that's a sign of things to come, uh, particularly for year two and year three of, of many institutions' test optional cycles, I think uh, the benefits are going to uh, be there. But my, <clears throat> my, my, my concern is I don't think uh, this is something that we're going to see across the board uh, throughout all institutions. Certainly, I'm not hearing that from all colleagues that I, I, I interact with on a regular basis in terms of their application numbers from overseas. But um, it is, uh, even at some state schools, secondary or uh, second level state schools, Missouri State, international apps are up 38 percent. Doesn't say whether that's undergrad or grad, but uh, obviously the common app is only undergrad. But we'll be interested to see when Council of Graduate Schools reveals some application numbers for the, for the current year. Uh, they usually don't do that until later in the spring. Uh, but we'll certainly see uh, what that looks like. But interesting, interesting data that's coming out, and we'll certainly keep our eyes on it uh, as to what uh, what the what that for what that potentially portends for the fall. Uh, what we will do now is move on to our second question. So, what might a U.S. international ed strategy look like? What would some of the components of that strategy need to be? And this is a uh, this is something I really um, spend a, I've spent a lot of time on. Uh, in my career, uh, certainly back uh, when I was on the, st on the uh, university side working with our state consortia in Indiana, Destination Indiana, we would be talking with uh, our colleagues at the State Department, so with who ran Education USA at the time, hey, what could this, what would ne need to happen to make an international ed strategy for this country? And there was talk about setting up like a, uh, an, uh, like an advisory board, uh, for of university reps and uh, association reps that could uh, advise um, a governmental strategy between commerce, state, and ed, uh, and maybe the White House. Uh, that never really materialized. Uh, it's kind of like a super consortia uh, sor consortium for the U.S. Uh, that didn't. That's never. That's a huge, huge uh, initiative, but never really got off the ground. Uh, there, is, uh, there are interagency working groups between commerce and uh, state, and uh, maybe uh, commerce and, ed and state, uh, but they really don't have any say-so on policy. Uh, it's really handed down to them from the administration, and until the administration takes a lead role in this, I don't think there's, uh, when it becomes a, a priority, and I don't think it is, uh, sadly, uh, there are certainly other priorities in, in this country that uh, demand attention at the highest levels. Um, but certainly we, you can easily make the case why international ed should be one of those, but it, it currently isn't. And politics-wise, even though it is technically a white hat issue where it is, uh, it does generate bipartisan support uh, for international ed initiatives, funding for Fulbright, funding for uh, study abroad programs, um, 
funding to make it easier for international students to come, whether that's regulation changes or scholarship programs, whatever it might be. Um, what an international ed policy looks like for the U.S., uh, there's news story after news story from Australia, from the U.K., from Canada, from New Zealand, where you see these national efforts where there's clear indication where education and immigration are coordinated, uh, where there is uh, a very significant uh, uh, communication channels between uh, government officials and university officials or association officials that really wrap their arms around the idea of international education as a priority. Uh, in Australia, it's a huge uh, industry, economic industry. I think it's the third largest uh, export industry in, for the country. Uh, in the U.S., it's six. Uh, still significant, $42 billion in 2018-19, or 2019-20, but we see, we don't see a real urgency around it that we see in other countries. We can see what Canada has done with their uh, tying together of uh, study and immigration uh, and work opportunities and residency eventually. So one of the things that has been proposed, and we talked a little bit about it last week on the Roundup, is uh, the current administration's plan that was announced uh, as part of the larger immigration reform legislation to staple a green card to every PhD graduate. Uh, and that's significant. Uh, it's been talked about for years. Uh, higher ed associations are fully supportive of this. Uh, universities are, are on board for this. Uh, it's really a, a, a step to give us a dog in the fight beyond just having OPT. Uh, because frankly, for those that are here, arguably, arguably longer than anyone else, those that are doing their doctoral programs, where they're coming in, uh, for two to three to five years of uh, coursework and then their dissertation work before they uh, uh, will defend and uh, uh, have their dissertation approved. Uh, that, uh, their defense of their dissertation, that's, uh, that's a huge investment, uh, though many of them are on, uh, on assistantships, fellowships, whatever the case may be. Uh, there is still time, and obviously uh, many of them are, are coming here for extended periods, with, potentially with family, without. So there are a lot of sacrifices that are made. Uh, anyone who's done a PhD, uh, certainly professionals I know I've worked with who've uh, started doctoral programs while they're working professionals, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a hard job to do, and uh, my hat's off to all of you who have done that successfully or even tried it. Uh, but this is certainly a point, uh, part of the Biden's uh, immigration plan that we would certainly support. Uh, the SMIE consulting it makes perfect sense. It certainly puts us on more level terms uh, with the study to work options that other countries have. Though this is limited to top level, um, top level graduates with doctorates, but uh, it's which is isn't the the largest part of our international student population. But if that's seen as a carrot at the end of, uh, of, the, of the student's study stream, whether it's bachelor's, master's, doctorate, or master's and doctorate, uh, or just doctorate, it's, if that's the carrot that can attract students here to the U.S. For the at the front end of the funnel, uh, just imagine what that's going to do at the back end. Um, so it's sort of like that happening. Uh, that happening in the future would be the equivalent of going test optional, I think, for undergraduates this year. You see huge rushes of uh, applicants this, this year as a result of that. So that's one element of what I think um, an international ed strategy for the United States uh, would need to involve. Uh, the other couple of components, to, uh, other component that I'll mention today um, is actually from another Forbes article uh, by Peter McPherson, who's the president of the APL, APLU. That's the Association of Public Land Grant Universities in the United States, so pretty much the flagship uh, state institutions in the country are members of APLU. And he has uh, made, the, made the case uh, very clearly that we're, we've been in a period of decline for new international students over the last few years, and uh, since 2016, actually, new international student numbers have dropped. Uh, it, the pandemic obviously exacerbated that problem this, this fall with 43% drop in new international students. But uh, what we see, uh, as I've talked about before uh, here in the Roundup and in articles I've, I'm, I'm writing for uh, IDP Connect, uh, the first, um, first one that came out last week or last month was on perspective, on how uh, in terms of strategic international enrollment management, uh, when you are planning strategically, you need to have a global perspective on the issue on the matter of international education, on international student mobility. 
and until you do, you're missing out on uh, parts of your strategy uh, that can be uh, informing your messaging, that can be informing your tactics in certain markets. Um, and that is certainly easy to see when you look at, for example, India, where uh, they are laser focused on anything to do with post-study work. Uh, that would be uh, changes to OPT, STEM OPT, H1B processing times and visas and related to that and uh, permanent residency applications. That is so important for that community. Uh, so that uh, that is something that I think when we, we look at global perspective on things that you have, uh, you know what other countries are doing. And I've, we've shared on the roundup here many times about what Canada is doing with study to work. Uh, what the UK has done with their post-study work visa, what Australia and New Zealand are doing. China even has a five-year post-study work visa for master's and doctoral students, uh, graduates from overseas. So until the U.S. can have, some, have that perspective institutionally, can have those perspectives to compete, but also at a national level, to realize that there are barriers that we have in place now that make it harder for students uh, who come, finish their doctorates, who want to stay, um, that have to go through potentially years of OPT, one to three years of OPT, then uh, H-1B for up to six years there, uh, and then have your company sponsor you for, uh, for, a, for a green card. This would cut out that process uh, of anywhere from, from uh, one to nine years uh, of potential time before, uh, before a, a doctoral student could then apply for permanent residency through their company, uh, that process would be accelerated from day one after they get their doctorate. They're going to have that green card. So instead of having to wait nine years, go through, uh, spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars and thousands of dollars on applications and all the support documents you need for those applications for OPT and, uh, and H-1B. Companies obviously sponsor students for H-1B, but before before that, uh, at the OPT stage, it's all on the students. So, what uh, what can we if if that's if we can eliminate that length of time where there's a degrees of uncertainty and hoops that students have to jump through, that if we can eliminate that, that is a huge boon to uh, students who are looking to come and do their doctorates here. If they don't know that they, they, if they know up front that they graduate with their doctorate. They are have they they have that road to permanent residency. It's it's there from day one after they get their diploma. So that is so so important, uh, and I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, but uh, the APLU president uh, he mentions three uh, specific pieces that uh, we would see a, a turnaround uh, that we need need to have. Uh, he he identifies three areas: welcoming visa policy and, and practices. Increasing support to Education USA to demystify the U.S. college application process, and expanding U.S. government support for initiatives that attract foreign students to the United States. Those three things, the uh, the what we've talked about earlier, some of the policy issues about green cards uh, for doctoral graduates, what we've uh, shared in the association uh, letters to the Secretary of State and now the DHS secretary who's just been approved uh, asking for regulatory changes that make it easier for like dual intent for F1 status uh, students on the visa processing side uh, for uh, the other kinds of things that on the DHS side processing times for OPT applications uh, having um, uh, uh, coming out on some policy issues to, to reverse uh, some of that's already happened with the Muslim travel bans being reversed, but you look at some of the things that were hanging over uh, from the Trump administration, the DS uh, elimination. Uh, if that were to ever happen, that would be a significant deterrent. So it's, uh, those are the kind of pieces of the puzzle that need to be part of an international ed strategy, simplifying the process. And that goes just not on the, on the government level for students uh, pro applying to uh, to the U.S. for visas, but it also goes on the institutional level. We should be simplifying our admissions processes. They're far too complicated. We get we think far too much of ourselves as institutions. Yes, we have the best institutions in the world, but we're all not the best institutions in the world. We have to simplify our process because it's far too complicated. Students who have to take three or four different tests, 
uh, have to pay all these extra application fees, have to gather letters of recommendation in, from, parents, uh, from faculty members and uh, professors in countries where that's uh, just not ever done, and just making, putting themselves at a much greater uh, chance of failure or not following through, not completing their applications. So when I counsel with my university clients these days and I, I talk about the missions processes, you got to simplify. Waive your application fees for your international audiences. Uh, go test optional for undergraduate. Think about that for your talk to you with your graduate departments and ask them how valuable these are. When you see some top top tier schools going test optional, not just because of pandemic reasons that was already happening, uh, when you see those top tier schools going test optional, there's a reason for that uh, because they've seen the value in uh, simplifying their processes, not just for international students but for all. Uh, and that's something that I think is is an important piece that we need to keep in the back of our minds is that uh, we we are much too complicated to apply to to get into. We're t we're so decentralized as it is as a, as a as a country. We're so um, every institution sets their own deadlines, sets their own uh, admission requirements, and it's it's a minefield for students to try and figure it out. We got to make it simpler. So that's that's where I think we're going with that. There's a lot of different components, and it's an evolving, uh, evolving, um, evolving case as to what that needs to look like. But I will say that there's there's uh, more positive signs than I've seen in a while uh, that are, might support an international ed policy, though I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Final question of the day, and this is a story that really goes to the heart of what I think international education should be, but isn't in certain countries. And we're going to talk about China. And the question is, how will China handle its dilemma with international students? Now, this is something that I, I think uh, everyone is aware of, who knows, who knows, who's been to China, who knows about relationships uh, uh, Chinese uh, citizens have with their government, uh, the ac their access to open and free information, the ability to have political uh, disagreements, the ability to talk about certain issues, or even know that these certain issues existed. Um, I've been doing application reading. I, I, I make that a regular part of my, uh, my yearly uh, work for my, for, with my business is to uh, read some applications for, uh, for some selective institutions and get a sense for, okay, what are students, inter international students, other applicants talking about? And read an app, read an essay from a, an American student who uh, was a, an adoptee from China, uh, and she, as as and a group of others, also adoptees, went back to China to talk with uh, students uh, in classes. And some of them had asked, some of the U.S. Uh, adoptees uh, that were returning asked questions of the of, of their Chinese peers of uh, kids who were their age and asked about, well, what do you think about Tiananmen Square? And they just had blank looks on their faces. They just, they're like, what? I know it's a square in, in Beijing, but they had no idea that something had happened in the 80s uh, where um, students, university students, stood up to the government and, and were protesting uh, there in, in Tiananmen Square, and there was a massacre. Uh, many were killed there, and that, but that isn't even in the discourse uh, in China. Uh, we know these things, uh, right? Uh, we know these things on the inside. But the students there, they, don't, they aren't able to have this kind of uh, free and open discourse in, in their classes. Uh, that's even seeped into uh, university levels uh, in China where uh, certain courses uh, or certain topics are still verboten, even though even, even in Western universities where academic freedom is supposed to be a guiding principle, there are limits, real limits, on what can uh, be discussed in class. There are professors that are sanctioned for that uh, by their universities for discussion of certain topics, uh, whether it be the Uyghur, uh, Uyghur concentration camps uh, in Shenzhen province uh, or Tiananmen Square or other things, uh, dissidents that are, are disappeared. Uh, those are all things that are, don't get free and open to, openly discussed in China. Um, but we now have, uh, China has opened its doors to international students in the last few years. We've talked about that regularly here on the Roundup, where you have Belt and Road Initiative countries that have sent students there, but you've also had other Western countries that are sending students there. Uh, they have had, uh, they were up to three or four in the top uh, receiving countries of international students, uh, have a lot of scholarship dollars that they've invested in there. But since the, since the pandemic hit, which happened right uh, as Chinese New, Chinese New Year was happening last year, where some students took advantage of that to go home and were trying to come back in after, but the, the, the borders were closed and they haven't been able to return for a year now. 
uh, and they have they're, they're, they've not gotten any real significant straight answers from from the government about when they can come back and, and continue their studies. Uh, they're, they're obviously the pandemic threw everybody for a loop. But uh, you look at what's happened uh, with the, the international students that are trying to get back into China because uh, they obviously invested a lot of time and effort in going there uh, to start or continue their studies and now they're not, not able to get back in. Uh, so there's been now this movement to create a student union, international student union in China uh, that has been uh, gathering over 11,000 signatures within three days of being posted uh, to uh, get uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to let them back in. Uh, but they're, they're not getting any traction with the government. Uh, they're doing their own social media campaigns, ironically, on Twitter and Instagram, both of which are banned in China, which we know, uh, that, uh, that they, these students tried to do, use Weibo, uh, one of the major platforms, social media platforms like Twitter in China. Uh, but the idea was ultimately abandoned, and this is in a Pi News article, I'll post the link to. Uh, it was the, that ultimate, that effort there on Weibo was abandoned due to abusive responses and doxing that was happening to those that were trying to rally support for an international student union and getting answers. So this, you see some real, real issues here. Uh, there were some exemptions like NY Shanghai student, NYU Shanghai students were, able, were exempted from this and were able to return last year. That was a kind of a test case, but there's some real issues here. But uh, the Chinese government certainly is not paying much attention to this. Uh, certainly is feeling no pressure to open the doors for these international students. But uh, I think they're doing long-term damage to themselves, frankly. They, which is for uh, as a country uh, that has invested so much in trying to attract students. I think they're doing a lot of damage in, in these last few months in terms of how they're treating uh, international students that were already on campus, we're trying to get back, we're trying to get back after the New Year's holiday, but they couldn't uh, and still can't a year later. So there's some real issues there and it's a real shame that uh, they're going down this road, but as a competitor nation uh, for international student interest, I think that's great news for us. Certainly uh, we'll talk more in future about the impact this is having in Africa uh, uh, in terms of relationships there with countries there and future students that might be going there which have been booming from Africa to China. That might be changing now too. So we'll take a look at all these stories uh, and more in the next uh, coming week's editions of the Roundup. But that's all we have for this week and we wish you the very best and look forward to uh, chatting with you again in the weeks to come. For those of you in the Chicago area, I'll, we'll, hopefully we'll be checking in with you tomorrow uh, when I present to uh, the Chicago Roundtable uh, on my, uh, my idea of the six P's of strategic international enrollment management. So until next time, have a great day. Cheers.